Hi, I'm Sheila Kuehl. Welcome to Get Used To It. Um, today we have a wonderful treat for you. Every so often on this show, as you may know if you've watched it before, we just do a, a whole hour of a one-on-one -on -one interview with one of the most interesting people in our community. Uh, and we've called the series Voices of Our Lives. And today I'm going to have that conversation uh, for your uh, viewing pleasure with Michael Kearns who is a theater artist, a perform wonderful performer and writer, and an activist, uh, and, a, and a, I would say an old friend, but you're not so old, so I would say a, a friend of long <laughs> standing. Old. Michael, welcome to Get Used to Thank It. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, I'm a great admirer of your work, and uh, I don't know if everyone around the country and uh, in Hawaii and Connecticut and all the places that they uh, watch us might have uh, been able to, to see you. So. Before we start talking sort of about how you got to this point, describe your work a little bit for, for me and for our audience. Well, I think that the handle, so to speak, is that I've been an openly gay actor since the mid-70s, and then more recently came out as an actor who's HIV positive. And those two facts have also informed the art that I do, so that almost all the work I've done in the past decade deals with issues around HIV and AIDS, even in television and film, I've done a few small things, but most of my work concentrates on the issues which seem to be the most important to me, the most urgent. Um, I've, I've always uh, managed to use the theater as a forum to say something, um, not only to entertain, but to also make a statement. And how, well, let's talk about how sort of you came into being and how one goes from sort of the, the little boy wherever you grew up to to who you are now. The little where, boy. Where did you grow up? St. Louis, Missouri. Uh -huh. And um, I think it was a fairly typical childhood. Dysfunctional, <laughs> uh, as, as many of us seem to have experienced. And I felt different from and odd and misplaced and ostracized and queer from a very early age, not queer homosexual, but queer not fitting in. And early on, I, you know, I couldn't throw a ball particularly well. I didn't excel in sports. I, but one day, I was put in the school play, and I excelled. Suddenly, I realized I could entertain. And from that moment on, it was just like this realization, oh my God, here is something that I can do. I have found it. And I was only, I was a, you know, eight or nine years old. I think I was actually eight years old when that happened. And from that moment on to this very moment, I've never, ever, ever veered from that path. I mean, my, my goal has always been from that moment on to be a better actor, a better artist, whatever that may be. I mean, it's become increasingly more varied and complicated as, as each year has gone by. But once I made that decision that I was going to be an actor, an entertainer, a performer, I never changed my mind. I never changed my focus. So was there a relationship, though, in terms of um, that, that feeling? Uh, certainly, you know, as a, as a former actor, I, I, you know. I understand, well, I understand that, that click, that feeling that this is where I should be, this feels so right. But I, I don't know how it was for you. It changed for me as I got older. The first thing was, it had some relationship to that not fitting in piece. Is that how it was for you? That's definitely how it was. And I think that many of us, particularly children, and maybe young adults also, I think many of us are drawn to the theater, to the world of make-believe, for all the wrong reasons. I think that we go there to escape, I went there to avoid my family, to get away from it, to become somebody other than who I was. As I got into my 20s, uh, coinciding with an awakening of other areas of my life, spiritual, sexuality, I found that the theater and being an actor was more of a way to truly connect with who I was as a person. So it was really the opposite of my initial goal, was to escape, then ultimately my goal became to be more of who I was. Now this isn't true of all actors because we know plenty who <laughs> continue, continue to escaping. camouflage and right. escape <laughs> and prove to us that they're something other than what they are. But I always thought that the art of acting, the purity of it, and the joy of it and the challenge of it is to access everything about your true authentic self. That's why I feel that acting is, is, has been so much a part of my growth as a 
activist. I mean, I, I don't lose sight of the fact that the word act is an activist, actor, mm -hmm. activist. This is all about being present, being alive, moving forward, taking a stand. So I found those two roles very compatible. But there wasn't real activism in your, sort of in your early acting. Were you ever in hiding as an actor? I mean, at, at, the, at the time when you began to realize, probably as a, a young guy, um, that you were gay, um, there was still some stigma to it. I mean, well, there was you, a lot of stigma. As you think of a career, I mean, there's a there's a clash there. Am I going to have a career, or am I going to be honest about this? Well, how, how did you've this stated it beautifully. I mean, it, there's really, to some extent, th those are the two roads that are offered. One, even today, in this in this uh, liberal city we live in, this is still the two choices. Am I going to have a career, a mainstream career, or am I going to choose the other fork in the road, which may be filled with artistic adventure and success, but it's not going to make you a million bucks, likely. <clears throat> and you may not get all the opportunities you think you deserve. And that's another story. I don't know that I was ever particularly trying to prove to anybody that I was anything other than a gay man, or even as a little boy, uh, an oddball, you know, <laughs> who was effeminate and um, outrageous and larger than life, all of those things. I don't think that, I just never took that from anyone. Even in my nascent Hollywood days, when it was being drummed into me by agents and people, because, you know, I looked like a leading man. And they were saying, you know, if you want a career, you've got to make sure that voice is lowered, make sure this is this and all, the, wear a wedding ring, go out with women, be seen in public. I never really did that. Maybe for five minutes I might have tried it. But it always just went against some natural instinct I had to be myself. And I was exposed to gay men and lesbians. I was in the theater at a very early age, and I was exposed to affectionate relationships, functional relationships between gay men and lesbians from a very early age. Before I could even attach any sense of sexuality to it, I saw these people loving each other, functioning. So I think that might have been part of it. It was not presented to me initially as anything wrong, immoral, vulgar, whatever. And, um, and thank God, the good thing I can say about my parents is that they also never that's the, maybe one of the few good things I can say, <laughs> but that is a big one, that they never said anything negative about gay people or homosexuality, ever, not a word. So here you are in St. Louis. You're a, a kid. Uh, you're nine years old or ten years old. You're now uh, becoming an actor, and uh, I, I guess this is a part of an identity that you embraced. I mean, was this a good thing for you as a kid? I think it was my salvage. I don't, I don't think that I would have survived my, I think I'd have been one of those kids who killed himself or, you know, became just uh, tragically depressed or I think it really, the theater saved me. It opened me to this world outside of myself. Not only in terms of acting, but in terms of just the literature of the theater. I wasn't a particularly scholarly kid, but I loved to read those plays, you know, and I could read Ibsen, and I could read Chekhov, and I could read Shakespeare, and I learned about human behavior, which to me was more important than learning about math or anything else. And it instilled me with this sense of self. That's really what it did. And uh, it gave me, you know, it satisfied some intellectual curiosity and some spiritual things I think were planted in those early, early years, which I wouldn't have had if I'd been an ordinary kid. I mean, I so threw myself into the theater with all my heart and soul that I think it really did save me. So you were the one in the, in the high school yearbook that uh, was, you know, the actor, right. and it was like, good luck on the New York stage. And and all of that, you got <laughs> it. And you know, here's the other interesting thing. Even though I was queer in high school, I mean, ostensibly different than and other than, and, and not like the boys who were on the football team and not like the boys who were the geeky scholars, I was popular. So I in spite of the fact that I wasn't doing much to camouflage my queerness or what was ultimately my gayness. I mean, I was having sexual experiences with men before I graduated from high school. 
So I knew I wasn't broadcasting those, but I knew who I was, and I knew what I was in this big picture, and I knew it was not the same as most of the kids. And I didn't go to great lengths to hide that. So it was an interesting, it's interesting in retrospect to look at that and see that I still had momentum as a human being, even though I wasn't engaged in this dance of deception. It's sort of like don't ask, don't tell. I mean, they, they kind of know, and they don't want to know. That's right, especially in the 60s in right. St. Louis, Missouri. Right. But I think, that, sir, I think the teachers knew. You know, I think that they knew, and some of the sophisticated ones nurtured me and, and, and were drawn to me because of it, some of the lesbian teachers and some of the gay male teachers. I mean, they knew what was going on here, and they put me under their wing and took care of me. So where from St. Louis? St. Louis to Chicago to Goodman Theater, which uh, was one at that point in time was one of the premier acting schools. And I was there for three years and really studied, 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 studied. But interestingly enough, even though this was a ostensibly very liberal acting school, it, it was my first touch of experiencing homophobia in terms of getting roles. Mm. And in spite of the fact that most of the teachers were gay or lesbian, they were, uh, they had that somewhat Hollywood philosophy that if they knew you to be a homosexual, you were not as eligible to play heterosexuals as were those who they knew to be heterosexual. Mm -hmm. So I got my first inkling of what that might be like, although by that point I was out, out, out. I mean, there was no way I was going to alter my offstage behavior to please anyone. So where from Chicago? Right here, right to Hollywood. Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because of a lover, to tell you the truth. I, I think in retrospect, it, it, it all worked out and it all has been an incredible ride, but I probably should have gone to New York, but then I wouldn't be here talking to you and maybe I would be some, you know, closeted New York Broadway star, I doubt that. But I came here and because I was having a relationship with somebody who had a real promising screen career uh, as a writer and a director, and that really determined the move. All my life I was going to New York, New York, New York, New York, and I wound up in Hollywood, where else? But it somehow seems Michael Kearns should have been in Hollywood, right? In, yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think, think so. So uh, I came here, and um, one of the first shows I did was a, a show called The Dirtiest Show in Town, which was written by Tom Ian, who has since died of AIDS, who also then went on to write Dream Girls and several, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. And that show somehow, it happened within the first year of my getting here, and it was a live show, very shocking in its day. It had nudity, it discussed issues like uh, bisexuality, pollution, the war in Vietnam. But somehow, again, I didn't know this when it was happening, but looking back, that theatrical experience where it was an ec my first equity show in LA, it really did set the stage for what would be the next 27 years of my life. Because I was not told to not be gay, mm -hmm. there was political content, there was sexual content, there was celebration of gay and lesbian lifestyle. Um, and so somehow, really, I've virtually done the dirtiest show in town over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I think that that's fascinating. And I love and respect Tom Ian for putting me in that show and realizing, you know, seeing that I had this fire and energy as this 22-year-old kid and this personality, which exceeded anything having to do necessarily with acting talent. It was just this sort of being who you were in the moment in those 70s. So is this a kind of a transition? When you were talking about it informing what you did for the next, what you are doing so far for the next 27 years, uh, do you mean because there was some, um, I don't know, sort of melding of content and art? Absolutely. I mean, this was certainly happening in the 60s, in a, in a very random and wild way. Right, but not uh, so I mean, much for me, because in the 60s I was in my teens. Here I was, 22 years old, and here was this show, which was not, by today's standards, the most politically profound piece of theater we've ever seen. But in those days, it was attempting to say things. At the same time, 
being fun and entertaining and sexy and lively and all those things. So yes, it was like, oh wow, I can do this. I can make money. I can have a good time. Uh, it's okay to take your clothes off. It's okay to be <laughs> gay. It's okay to be wild and outrageous. It's okay to talk about these issues. So it, and of course, again, at the time, I don't know that I knew this, but when I look back and I, I see how profound that moment was for me, because then there was no going in the closet after that show. You know, I think it was the first time I was on the cover of The Advocate. And it was the first time, you know, I wasn't, I don't think that in those days, <clears throat> the statement about being openly gay was really a part of the lexicon. But eventually, in the later 70s, it did become that. But I just felt a freedom as, a, 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 as an artist, as a gay man, as somebody who had some sense of, of the, the universe and what needed to be changed about it. So these things all coalesced in that show and really set the stage for. But at the same time, probably closed the door, hey? closed a door. Interesting, yes. Even though everyone in town came to see that show, all the casting people and all the producers and celebrities, it was just loaded every night. Less so then than today on some level. I mean, I think there was this period where gay was, you hear about gay being in now, it is in with a lot of restraints mm -hmm. attached to it. There was a period where it seemed that maybe things were going to be okay, especially in the 70s and as the 70s progressed. But I think that a door looked like it might have been opening, but in reality it was closing. And by the time AIDS started appearing in the early 80s, it had really closed. I mean, even then, as my reputation as an actor who played gay roles in the theater became cemented, that was virtually all I could play on television mm -hmm. and film. And so there was a period where basically all I would be cast in was the gay guy. And do you regret that? No, not at all. I think that it has made me sometimes obstreperously angry at this town, sometimes unduly resentful, and sometimes a little loud. But uh, <laughs> that's just my working through it. I think I have a. Uh, I think I'm justified in being somewhat resentful and loud and angry. Uh, I think that now I'm older and and I'm toning that anger down, and I have other things to concentrate on. And in many ways, I'm grateful for it because it forced me into another artistic stratosphere that I probably, if I had a TV series in the late 70s, would I have created intimacies, more intimacies, rock, all the solo work that I've done? Probably not. So it forced me to go deeper. It forced me to look at myself. It forced me to become an artist, really. I mean, between the kind of rejection of the mainstream community, Hollywood, film and television, and the beginnings of AIDS, that's what did it. So wh was Intimacies your first uh, solo show? There was one solo show before that called The Truth Is Bad Enough, which was about the 70s and about coming out and about being gay, a gay male in the culture. And was it a, a, a monologue about your own life? Or was it more in the style that you started to adopt in, uh, in intimacy? Good question. It was my first sort of autobiographical piece. I think that everybody who does solo work, I've since done interspersed some autobiography in my work, but I think it's like the first, the first book someone writes. You have to sort of regurgitate <laughs> all that nonsense. That, and, I, and I did it, and I tried to contextualize it and make it as universal as possible, although it, it had that sort of self-indulgent quality about it. Now, if somebody had said that to me then, I would have, like, <laughs> bit their head off, sh <laughs> screamed, cried, yelled. But now I can say it myself looking back. I mean, it's one thing to be old and look over this <laughs> career. It's comforting. We wouldn't know that yet, Michael. Well, I feel like I do know. It. Oh, all right. Anyway, but Intimacies was the, I think, the shining moment in terms of really becoming an artist. And I think that I, I'm not sure that everyone becomes an artist because they see their friends die in front of them and fear their own life and um, can't stop crying and can't stop grieving. But I think that that's why I was pushed into the role of an artist. 
up until that time, I think I was an actor, an entertainer, somebody who, you know, had a personality and could do certain things and do them well. But the depth of my passion only came with the depth of my sorrow and loss and pain. Did you know that you were uh, positive at the time? No, not initially. Um, intimacies happened in about 85, 86, and it was shortly thereafter. There was other AIDS work prior to intimacies also, a lot of plays about AIDS and, that I directed or was in or produced. But intimacies was the, it, it was just like it became my thesis or something. Describe that uh, for, for well, those out there who have Absolutely, who didn't many get people to see don't it. know. In intimacies, I play six people with AIDS, and I play people who are wildly and widely divergent. I got sick of, after the uh, initial uh, five years of the 80s, the story of the gay white man. I mean, we heard this story over and over and over and over and over again. It was as if there was no one else in the planet who had HIV or AIDS if you looked at the theater. Even though on the one hand, the gay community was screaming, you know, it's not only us, we kept depicting over and over and over the plight of the gay white male, which that story needs to be told, deserves to be told, should be told on every street corner, corner in America, including in this current climate in 1998. However, we need to tell other stories. And finally, I just got tired of reading those scripts and being in those plays and directing those plays and producing those plays. I said to myself, look, you know, let's read the paper here and see that there are black women with HIV AIDS, there are homeless people with HIV AIDS, there are Hispanic people with HIV AIDS, and each of their stories is particular and different, and they suffer isms that are different than the gay white male isms, yet that is the soul and heart connection of all of us on this planet. This all sounds good. I mean, the the point being that I had to say, what would it be like for me to be a black street hooker with no money, no insurance, um, living virtually on the street who has HIV or AIDS, who might have little kids to support? And I put myself in these roles of these different people, and it, it became a a success and I didn't know that when I started out you know and then I I've virtually spent the next several years touring all over the world doing this material practically every major city in the United States and then I added about six more characters called that more intimacies and then I did variations and it seemed to be seems to be my contribution and um, you know I've continued since then but nothing seems to me to be as connected to a picture larger than my narcissistic um, world. You know, and I, think that this, and I think that this is still more profoundly the issues that need to be discussed today. Again, you know, we're on this euphoric trip of AIDS is over and, and uh, the cocktail this and the cocktail that, and yes, I'm on the cocktail and I'm grateful, but I have insurance and I'm white and I'm male. And there are a lot of people in this world who aren't any of the above, who are suffering from AIDS just as severely as people were suffering from AIDS in 1981. It is no different for the homeless person, for the woman, the black woman with five kids on the street whose children are HIV positive. It has not changed at all for any of those people. And if we haven't learned anything from this disease, haven't we? I thought that one of the things we learned when we were visiting the bedsides of our friends was compassion and a, a depth of understanding and something spiritual. Well, that spirituality and that compassion and that depth of understanding cannot just be confined to the block we live on or to West Hollywood or to L.A. It has to become more global and bigger than ourselves. Well, it was very powerful to watch your first show, or the first, the, you know, the intimacies. Uh, it was very powerful to watch you uh, transform yourself, I mean, l literally, uh, with, n I mean, nothing. We're not talking really a little lighting change, a little music, but it was you. And it was simply from within. Um, and it was such empathy. Uh, and, and really required the audience to, to see that. 
uh, wasn't preachy, wasn't, hello, I'm making these connections for you. It was simply to present these people, a very powerful, a uh, very powerful piece. I teach this to my students. There are times when the theater is magic. And you have to do a lot of work to get it to be magic. You have to work on your voice, and you have to work on your body, and you have to work on, you have to become skilled, and you have to rehearse, and you have to do, th but then there is a point where it's magic. Intimacies, more intimacies, to some extent rock, was magic. It was blind faith that those voices would come every night. Mm -hmm. It was something way bigger than anything I'd been taught in acting school. It was something far greater than that. And it changed me as a person. I mean, not only did it maybe help somebody in the audience, but every it was selfish too. Because every night I got to experience something out of my own head, out of my own, as I said, you know, my own self-indulgent, self-involved voices going on about how important I am. <laughs> you know, and we all live in that voice sometimes, too often. Well, I, uh, tell me about your new work. Okay, three new characters. It's called um, Telltale Kisses, and um, I, I think it will be running throughout uh, May, actually, in L.A. Um, three generations of gay men looking at the, as the millennium approaches, looking at loss, sex, love, um, growing up. I think it's a growing up piece for me. Uh, I, interestingly enough, I play somebody about 30, somebody about 50, and somebody about 70. And in some ways, I emotionally relate to the guy 70 almost more than the other two. I just feel he's a dad, and he talks about his, his relationship with his child. But I look at, uh, it's very romantic, this piece. And it's, I think it's about the struggle that we continue to have, particularly gay men, in terms of identity, about our sexuality and about issues of compulsive sexuality and issues of romance and issues of um, marriage, children, all those things. Now, will it be called an AIDS piece? Of course, because my, my, na my middle name is AIDS. <laughs> um, so it will be called an AIDS piece, although it's about so much more. As you point out, so are the intimacies pieces. But um, yes, AIDS continues to be a backdrop in my work, and I suppose until the last person on the face of the earth does not have AIDS, it will continue to be the backdrop for my work. And what do these three men know about AIDS? Because you, you must have, you identify some distinction. I mean, I, I wish that it was possible to, 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 to describe, but I mean, you have to see the whole performance, I think. Um, how the, the, the teachable moments in your work are really from within. It doesn't ever tell us anything. It shows us. A, a lot, but what what is the difference between and among? I haven't asked you this question, so I'm. This is a brand new one. The what the seventy year old man knows about AIDS and thinks about AIDS. What the fifty year old and what the thirty year old? Well, that's a great, 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 great question. The thirty year old is going to go straight after being a circuit boy, a party boy, a fast lane boy. He is going to go straight. He believes that he will one day have the virus rid from his system. Mm -hmm. And he is going to go home to Indiana and get married and raise a family and please his parents. Mm -hmm. So that's what he thinks about it. So it's a kind of almost um, penance. That's the penance he'll yes. do for he'll being get rid of this. a bad boy wow. in the fast lane. Wow. It hurt, makes me, it hurts to say it. And then the second character has gone blind from CMV. So his first line is, uh, good news, bad news, alive, blind. Wow. <laughs> he never thought he was going to live. Mm -hmm. So here he is, blind, with many more years ahead of them, him than he ever thought all of his friends are dead or dying. So he has to cope with, why am I alive? The, the duality of wanting to die and be with his friends and be with his memories and yet having to confront 
the future as a blind person. Mm. Um, and the third character has been in a monogamous relationship for 40 years with a lover. He, his son was virtually taken away from him when he was a young man and the son reconnects with him and the son is dying of AIDS and the lover is dying of Alzheimer's. Mm. So we have the backdrop of him dealing with these two deaths. He, however, is reconciled that life has reconnected him with his, his son and given him a 40-year relationship. And how, even though he's experiencing this, this loss, how can he be anything other than grateful? The last line of the show is, I must remind myself that I am a very lucky man. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that that's me speaking. Mm -hmm. And in spite of every loss, and there are too many to even enumerate, and in spite of the own HIV that continues to course through my veins in spite of drug cocktails, I'm a lucky man. Well, there are and a lot of reasons <laughs> that we could name, but I think Tia is one of them. <laughs> Will you talk about Tia? Tia. You know, I was thinking today, Tia is, for the record, my three and a half, soon to be four year old, African American adopted daughter. <laughs> Tia Catherine Kearns. And I was thinking today that Tia is the perfect match for me. I mean, every aspect of <laughs> Tia's personality, even the things that other people might find <laughs> problematic or even offensive, I love in a person. I mean, she's tough, she's stubborn, she's loud, she's opinionated, she's decisive, she's no nonsense. I mean, she's just the perfect person for me. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have our squabbles and our uh, clashes of temperament because we are so alike. But somebody gave me this child who, whose personality is exactly what I, it's the qualities I like about you. It's the qualities I like about all my friends. This fierceness, this won't take the answer no, this determination, this facing every day. So she's my comrade, my friend, my, I mean, it's, it's just a, an uncommon bond that I can't quite describe. And how did you come to be Tia's dad? Well, I decided after my lover, Philip, who you knew, died, I, I looked at the rest of my life and I said, what now? I've had this career success. I had a successful relationship, albeit one that was short-lived. I've had certain gifts and experiences and things in life. What is, what is it that I haven't had that I've always wanted? And the answer to that question kept coming back to be a dad, to be a father, over and over. So a long process of discussing every which way. Should I co-parent? Should I find a lesbian who's willing to do an arrangement? And I interviewed people and I spoke to people, some of whom you probably know. And I <laughs> went to lawyers and I went to, you know, I read books and I read articles and after all was said and done, I decided no, what I really wanted was to be a single parent and to take all the responsibility. And so first I did foster care to get my feet wet and to see what the challenges were like and to see if I was up to it emotionally, physically, stamina-wise, all those things. So I had several situations in foster care and then Tia came to me as a foster baby with pretty much uh, a likelihood of moving into an adoption. And then there was an arduous two-year, seven-month period where we didn't know 100% that she would be my daughter, but then finally that happened. And, um, and was it, I mean, happily ever after. Was it difficult because you were gay? Was it difficult because you were HIV positive? I mean, was, how Here's did that what's play interesting. into that? It was primarily difficult, this is the interesting aspect, because as male, huh. the issues of uh, a man wanting to be a parent are so out of whack in terms of what the system thinks, what the public thinks, what 
most people think. Uh, it's just that why would this single man forget gay, forget HIV positive, forget over 40, forget white, all those, those were all issues. The biggest issue is why would a man want to take care of a baby? Gay men can't grasp this, a lot of them. Women were my allies from the get-go, lesbians and straight women. No woman ever said to me, but you're HIV positive. Not one, ever. They understood this overwhelming need to be a parent. They never had that problem, mm -hmm. understanding that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the biggest problem. The others were all hurdles. My being white was a hurdle. My being gay was a hurdle. My being HIV positive was a hurdle. My being over 40 was a hurdle. Probably my being an actor on some level was a hurdle because I don't have a steady income. So I basically had everything going against me in terms of this adoption, including not the support of some people who were my very close friends. Mm. So even that I didn't have. So I learned a lot about myself during these last few years. And your friends, I guess, And too. my friends, some of whom, I mean, I also have an incredible support system of friends who who helped me on a daily, weekly basis with Tia. Otherwise, I could never have done it. And that also, I want to point out, to comfort the viewers, because people do need comforting on this issue, and they really do. Her life is set up, if, if I die in a car accident later this afternoon, that the people she's been surrounded with for more than three years, she will continue to be surrounded with and by. And she has many relationships. I may be the primary spoke on the wheel, but the wheel will continue to move without me. And I've set it up this way consciously from the get-go, never denying the fact that I'm HIV positive and not necessarily believing that the drug cocktails are going to keep me alive for the next 50 years. I'm always in reality mode and have been from the beginning. Tia came into the world with a big question mark over her head. Mm. She could have gone into a foster situation where she was thrown across the room and killed before she reached the age of one. She could have been in multiple foster homes. She could have been in an adoptive circumstance, w which was not perfect. So I think she's had a pretty great life so far. And even if something happens to me, I believe that her life will continue to be a great one. Being nurtured by people who are black and white, gay and straight, young and old, you know, she's a very um, variegated family. Must be fun system. going to the grocery store with the two of you. <laughs> well, it's, it's like watching a test of people's responses. Uh -huh. I mean, I now sort of block it out. But Tia also has a tendency to like want to connect with everyone in the grocery store. So this isn't a demure <laughs> little child who's sort of minding her own business. This is a child who's saying, hi, hi, do you have a cat? Do you have a dog? What's your name? How many cats do you have? What's, your, what's her name? What are you buying? Da, da, da. So, you know, they you know, sort of look. And, then, and, and we've been through everything, including told, screamed at. I was screamed at once in a Haight-Ashbury health food store. That's not your baby by a black woman, just mm -hmm. screaming at me. Mm -hmm. So I've had the ugliest experiences. I've also had particularly black women who come up to me because they can put the circumstance together and say, it's great you have her, I, I just want you to know. So sometimes people overcompensate to let me know they're supportive. Mm -hmm. But other times, you know, lot, I hate to say this, but lots of you know, snotty looks from gay men mm. um, at the French marketplace sometimes. You know, mm. like, what are you doing on our territory with that child? Mm. You know, and you just sort of say to yourself, you know, we hear all this stuff about the 90s and about we're going to be parents, and, but when you're out there in the world living it, there's a small number of us, who, they're more lesbians than gay men, but there's a small number of gay men who are being parents at this point. And there's still a lot of discrimination and judgment about it. Well, it's funny when we, we think about identity, and I know that uh, when I first understood that I was a lesbian, and I was uh, 17 in a relationship for a, a long time, 12, 13 years, there was just no question that we weren't going to have children. We didn't know exactly right. how to go about, we didn't tell anybody. Absolutely. Um, and so in coming to that decision, to some extent, I can't speak for gay men, but that generation or some of that generation that didn't already have children, it's kind of like you draw the line and then you justify it in a funny way. No, no, you're like, well, they were, I mean, they used to say breeders. 
You right. know, that was what straight people did, and we didn't do that. We weren't locked into that. And, <laughs> you know, then you would wake up and go, now, why are we celebrating this again? I can't remember, because family is such a wonderful thing. And there began to be sort of this, this turn. Uh, many lesbians who already had children were saying, hello, you're excluding us from this That's community. Right. You know, you can't make fun of us, etc." But it was, and gay men who had lost their children and really had we also blocked out. Realized they could reunite piece. with them. Right, right. No, and also, the, here's another interesting point to be made. I think that many gay men have internalized that molester role that has been foisted upon them mm -hmm. by the system. When I went to adopt, the first thing that was said to me, as I explained to you, was your biggest issue is male. Male equals molester in the minds of many people. Mm -hmm. Just male, a single male wanting to adopt or be around children mm -hmm. is dangerous. And that's, and how could gay men not have internalized that role, that, that stereotype. It's on the news every day. I mean, they love nothing more than to announce that that molester is a gay man. They don't announce the sexuality when it's a heterosexual. Right. So right. we've internalized that. And I think a lot of gay men don't believe they're worthy of parenting. And we got to change that. I see the, one of the most thrilling things is I can see it in the eyes of these young boys, like if T and I are in a gay identified sort of coffee shop and you see them and you can see this sense of oh my god I could do that I see it in their faces and they're the ones who probably will you know I mean I, I think as, as we evolve and I think we are we're learning we're we're absolutely learning it must be very hard though you know we say uh, gee it's wonderful for you young people now because we've opened all these doors and you can have this gay identity and you're just fine but I I see them struggling still. I mean, around AIDS issues, for instance, I don't see all this certainty in young men. And I hear rumors and stories about uh, high-risk behavior. And do, do you see, I mean, what changes do you see sort of in AIDS activism or awareness or whatever, in, especially in the gay male community? I think we're in trouble. I think that... Um, I still think that the issues of self-esteem, I think that the issues are much more complicated than simply saying to somebody, have safe sex. And I, I think that we need to look at so many different issues that we're not looking at. I mean, we're trying to just put this, don't, you know, just say no mentality on a fragile psyche and a fragile sensuality and sensibility. It's just not, and it's not working. I mean, these kids are having inordinate amounts of unsafe sex. Seroconversion is going on at shockingly high rates. And um, that's the younger population. Then we have the older population, some of whom are HIV positive or have AIDS, who are camouflaging and disguising in another way this sort of obsessive quest to remain young and beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we look at the pages of the gay papers, this, this obsessive issue with vanity and, and, and what one looks like, liposuction and Botox this and muscles that, and what, where have we learned, have we learned any lessons? Isn't there something that we need to solve and fix on the inside? Shouldn't we be looking at what's inside? Um, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about my generation, and I'm concerned about the youngsters. The other thing is I think that still young men are seroconverting because they want to be part of the club. They feel so ostracized, so less than, to so be negative, disconnected. They, they want to become HIV positive, right. to become part of this fraternity. It looks good. It looks glamorous. There's support group. And I am so conscious of this that, you know, learn the lessons without becoming HIV positive. If I had it to do over again, I would have learned these lessons without zero converting. The advantage here is, is to listen to people who have lost and, and those from the grave who are sometimes speaking to us, like Paul Manette and Jim Pickett, et cetera, one need not zero convert to be, to feel powerful or to feel a part of. 
And I think that that's out there. I just think that when we act like AIDS is over, and I hear this repeatedly, and act like AIDS doesn't exist any longer, we are back into a state of delusion and denial that could only be matched by the early 80s as we end the 90s. And I think that we have to wake up all over again and, and reassess the issues and particularly look at the youth. Well, I think it's a power, part of the power I come back to in, in the work that you do. Um, it, it's always interesting to me that people uh, go into politics because they think they will, uh, you know, manufacture a world that is somewhat different. Um, and the theater is very much like that, but it's kind of spotty. It just depends on who shows up, in a way, who your audience is. Uh, what are you going to, you know, to get from this? Uh, when I was in junior high school, I went to see Julie Harris do The Lark, you know, the, mm. the story of Joan of Arc on Wee's play, uh, here at the Biltmore, when there was still a theater at the Biltmore wow. Hotel. And I went back 13 times <laughs> just to watch. Uh, she was on stage every minute. And it wasn't just that she was luminous as an actress. There was such strength and power in the way she played it. It was like every performance, those voices were a surprise to her. And it was not that she was so incredibly special, but what she had to do with it. And I think that on some level, it was such a message to me that if you do hear voices, you have to do something with it. You have to save France, wow. you know? I mean, it was very, it's very interesting. And to this day, and you can only imagine how long ago I was in junior high school, <laughs> I remember those performances and that message. And the, the first time I saw you perform, solo perform, I was so moved, I couldn't forget uh, the characters and, you know, and what they said. And what you do is so important. Um, so say again the, the name of your new show and, the new and show where is it's called going to go. Tell Tale Kisses. And it will have five performances at Highways, which is my home and my sanctuary and my church. And then it will move uh, to Glaxa Studios on uh, Sunset and Silver Lake. And I'll be there during June. And do you think you might be traveling with it? Now I that probably you have will Tia, though. travel less with Tia. And the older Tia gets, the less we'll travel probably. I traveled in the earlier days a little bit easier. But you know, that's fine too. I mean, I'm, I'll, what I will do is more one-nighters as opposed to a run. So I'll do a bigger venue. It's not ideal for me because I love being in small theaters. I love being in theaters with like five people in the audience. I'm the only <laughs> actor in the world because I feel like I can reach everybody well, in the room. Well, Highways has what? Two, right, you know. about 100. Yeah. 100's great. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'll get around. I, I, I will continue to uh, get the message out there. I, I love your analogy about hearing voices because I sometimes think that that's really what it is. I mean, I think that uh, one does hear some voice that's larger than oneself. And I think that too often we say, oh, this is ridiculous, and you go for the mundane or the pedestrian, when what we need to be doing is listening to that higher consciousness, that spiritual voice, that voice that is ephemeral at best in the real world and follow it. I mean, I heard some voice that said, be an actor. I then heard some voice that said, be an activist. And thank God I listened to those voices and I didn't go off and become a bank teller. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with being a bank teller. <laughs> Be closer to a lot of money than we both are. <laughs> oh, I'd God say. only knows. That's, <laughs> I've never been around that much money. Um, the spirituality that you, you mentioned it a couple of times, and I wonder um, the connection, what the connection is, uh, as you see it, between the work that you do and the way you do your work and this spiritual quality you've talked about. I think that any actor who is acting with a purity of heart and soul. It has to be a spiritual experience. You are, in essence, being willing to go up in front of a room full of people and show yourself in all its entirety. Not always the most attractive aspects of yourself. Sometimes ugly things. Sometimes uh, unattractive things that make the audience want to turn away. This is an act of, a sublime act of giving, or it should be. Acting is truly the opposite of what is perceived by many people. Many people perceive acting to be a narcissistic, vainglorious kind of 
um, uh, masturbatory profession. When in truth, acting is about giving, 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 which is spiritual. It's about connecting with people other than yourself and finding human threads that connect. That's spiritual. It's about, it's, it's an offering up to an audience, whether there are five or 5,000, you are going out there and giving yourself and you are giving sometimes the playwright, if that playwright is different than the performer, you're transmitting those words, those feelings, those thoughts. How can it not be spiritual? I think it's just as spiritual. I think going to the theater can be, at its purest, an equally spiritual experience to going to a church. And in fact, we've seen that, particularly with around issues of AIDS and gay and lesbian coming out stories. The, the people are sobbing in the theaters. People have transformative experiences like you had going to the theater. And they're not going to get a lot of this in TV and film because it can't go quite as deep or as far. And it's not personal. I mean, it's not real in a funny way. I mean, there it looks real. You get engaged in a film. Uh, television less so just because it's small and it's in your own home and it's easy to right. disconnect. You cannot disconnect in the theater. You are in no. there. It's dark. Uh, you are so close. And especially, I think, in the in solo performance, uh, even in a larger venue, if, you know, if, if 100 people seems large, you're very close. We're very close you to you, Michael. And you can't really escape, especially your own intensity. I mean, it's a very intense and feels very uh, individual uh, connection, good. I know, as, as a member of, of the audience. Yeah, good. You do it. I mean, you do it very well. And as you well. said, it's demanding on the audience. This is also, I mean, we live in a world where one, you know, is used to a three-minute video being about as demanding as some people can get. <laughs> but it's demanding to go spend an hour or 45 minutes or an hour and 45 minutes in a theater. It, it does demand something. You have to bring yourself into that seat when you go to the, or ideally you should. And it's much more confrontive than, as you point out, the TV or, or film. And that's why I belong in the theater. Now, I want to ask you one difficult question with a few minutes remaining. And you, you touched on it a little bit in talking about Tia. And um, I wonder it because you, you know that you're HIV positive and you have been for a while. And the cocktails are wonderful and we're all very happy. Um, that now you have to worry about what to do with your life because that's, that's right. a really good thing. But you must also have a sense, as you indicated because you said you were planning for Tia, you must also have a sense that it might not be as long as it might have been uh, were you not. Does that scare you? I really don't think that it scares me. I think that it makes me sad, particularly in relationship to Tia. At this point, the only creature I can't imagine saying goodbye to is Tia. I can imagine, because I have imagined it, all of the others. I can imagine saying goodbye. I can imagine giving them mementos and having this be a pretty clean and neat experience. I can't fathom separating from that child. I cannot fathom it. It's not something that I can go to. And that really is the biggest hurdle about my death at this point. It's not about anything else. I mean, I think I could die pretty peacefully later this evening if it weren't for that bond. And she'll be fine. I really believe that also. I think she'll be fine. I just, I have to, I don't know. I guess that's my task, is to, to find some peacefulness about severing that relationship. Well, you, you really aren't severing it, in a way, no, I guess. I mean, that's sort of the spiritual aspect of your having been, having made the decision to enter into it. That's right. Um, that's the because marriage. Because you gave that's her something. The bond. You know, that she would never have had. And what a happy kid. I mean, everybody out there watching you imitate her in the grocery store has said to themselves, now that's, that kid is secure. They do say You know, that. that's I mean, a happy kid or she wouldn't be going around saying, how many kid. cats do you have? It says, she's whatever, an incredibly, right? and people say that, you know, and she really is. And she has a sense of herself that I think I've instilled in her. And I think that's all we can do for anyone. 
I think that's all we can do for an audience. I think that's all we can do for a lover. I think that's all we can do for a student. All we can do for our children is to instill them with a sense of okayness about who they are. I never tell her to be anything other than what she is. I don't tell her to not be stubborn or not be difficult or not be opinionated or not be strong and, and willful. I don't tell her not to be those things. I tell her that, you know, you're going to have to curtail sometimes to the world <laughs> outside, but I want her to be all those things. Well, I can't believe that a whole hour has gone by. Neither can and I. And we're <laughs> at the end of it already, and I have had a wonderful time. So have I. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you Thank had you. as wonderful a time as we had since, as Michael has pointed out, it's the audience's experience That's that really right. is it's the for important them. part of it. It's for you, and I hope you get to see Michael perform if you haven't seen him perform. Michael Kearns, uh, theater artist, activist, uh, and I'll tell you, once you watch him perform, you could absolutely get used to it.